15 years. We moved a few years ago out to Iowa and we worked at the Iowa State Veterinarian Clinic. He's a certified dairyman carrier. He's an associate with the Worshipful Company of Carrier. He's a good friend and very entertaining and, and is uh, going to share with us what some of the things he's learned through shoeing some of the horses in Iowa. So I put a lot of information on in this. Yeah. Some of it's basic, some of it's maybe a little bit more technical, but I'd rather not lecture, I'd rather have a discussion. So anybody that wants to comment, besides Craig, I'd appreciate it. If there's a seat in the back for Craig, I'd like to move him back there. <laughs> I don't see one though. You're stuck. <laughs> so like Jennifer was saying, I started at Iowa State about four years ago. And I'm, I just shoe out of a shop there. I don't go out in the field at all anymore. Um, a lot of the work I do is one foot on one horse and a lot of them are laying sideways on the OR table. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag of everything. You never know what's coming in. We got some pretty cool cases towards the end that I'll, that I'll show you. And then I do a two-week rotation for the fourth year vet student. So the way vet college works, the first three years is all the book work. The last year, the fourth year, they go through rotations through the hospital, both small animal and large animal. There's three required rotations. The rest are electives. So mine is an elective. I think like radiology and uh, medicine, there's a few other that are... Uh, are required but so I get all the students that are either track and equine or large animal mix that come through it's been recently lovingly named the farrier appreciation rotation so what I'm trying to do there is not teach them how to shoe horses I'm trying to teach them to never send us a shoeing prescription that's my goal and so I've got four generations of vets out now that will never send you a shoeing prescription. But they, what they figure out at the end of two weeks is that what we do is really hard and it requires a lot of skill. So they, they do develop a lot of respect for us pretty quick. I get them under horses, they pull some shoes, their legs shake. I get them in the forge to forge some hook picks, they get some burns and blisters. and They, they realize that what we do, we make it look easy. I always try to include at least one picture of my... <laughs> this is actually my last apprentice. Uh, I don't have a picture of Scott yet. Um, he's been careful not to expose himself. <laughs> so, but sooner or later I'll get a picture of Scott. Too. I know you guys all know your anatomy. I just want to review stuff really quickly because Knowing the anatomy, this is part of the problem with the vet college. And this is one thing I realized right away getting into teaching that rotation. Those fourth year vet students can name all the structures in the limb. And they can pretty much tell me where they originate, where they, where they uh, finish off in the limb. But they can't tell me how they function. And they can't tell me how we manipulate or relieve tension or increase tension on any of those structures. That's not in their curriculum. And I think sometimes we lose track of it too. But it's real simple. I mean, everything that attaches forward of the limb, we have to decrease the palmar angle of the coffin bone to relieve. The deep digital flexor tendon in the straight sesmoidium or oblique ligament, those are the only two things that benefit when we raise the palmar angle. And that's, it's, that's where the irony comes in because every prescription we've ever got is to raise the palmar angle, right? So there's, there's for, every re, uh, for every action, there's a reaction, right? So when we manipulate one thing one way, part of that load's going somewhere else and we have to know where it's going or we're liable to cause a second problem down the road. I wanted to throw in just a short thing on radiographs here because this is where we, we cross over pretty frequently with the vets. I mean, how many were shooing in here before digital radiographs came out? So it was 
it was kind of a pain in the butt back then because you had to go in, either go up to the vet clinic or the, they leave a copy with the owner and you get to see it a week or two later. You never knew where it was really in your shoeing cycle. Prior to that coming around, it wasn't until digital radiographs came out that we started getting radiographs with all kinds of letters and angles and arrows and points and different things like that. They helped us a lot because they're clear. Um, but I'm going to get into how we got it. We have to kind of take what we see here with a grain of salt sometimes. So just real quick so you can have an intelligent conversation with the vet. This is a lateral view. We, so every, it's, it's where the beam is going, where it originates and where it's going. So this would actually be a lateral medial, like it's labeled up there. See, I'm a genius too. Lateral medial, dorsal palmar, and then we'll get into everything in between real quick. But those are the two that we see most often, are our laterals and our DPs, and sometimes our skylines and, and navicular views. This is why I wanted to show you. This is um, because we're getting these so often, and I've pretty much got most of the surgeons that I work with out of the habit of doing this to me. Positioning of the horse changes everything. And so when these digital radiographs came out, we got obsessed with throwing ourselves under the bus because our trim wasn't quite right. You know, we, we look at these and go, oh, my, my palmar angle's not right in the coffin bone. I got a little impingement medial laterally. But the position of the horse, this is just our lateral views, and you can see what it does two feet on the block, one foot on the floor, one foot raised, so you got your fetlock descending a little bit. So this is what we have to keep in mind. Horses don't sprain suspensories, they don't tear collateral ligaments when they're standing with two feet on the block. They do it when they're moving. So there's a balance there between figuring out how they hit the ground and how they look when they're, they're viewed there in the radiograph. That makes sense? This is how I think that we should analyze our trims. It's the closest thing that I can get to a horse actually moving through the sand. Just put him in an inch and a half of foam or two inches of like the exercise mat, pick up his other limb. You watch his fetlock descend and you watch the toe drop. So when, and there's some stuff in here later on the negative palmer angle, I'll talk about that. But every one of those horses that I've seen with a negative palmer angle, I put him in the foam, pick up his other limb, is no longer a negative palmer angle. So just I knew to... you were going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> what, about, what about the backwash? Does it change with the with the wither being the wither being what three three inches higher than the the hip? Say that again. The the hind end of the horse. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So Craig's point is that we put these horses just on the front two blocks. But then we've just made that horse stand up. Because they did that long thing a long time ago with the Seattle shoe, where the Seattle shoe was like added all that material because it's <coughs> basically the same thing you're doing there, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, that's why, that's my point with showing you guys this is, is don't let yourself get pushed under the bus. Don't throw yourself under the bus. These are just, these are just. This is one second in time at that moment. And when you get those radiographs sent to your cell phone, oftentimes those vets are having to shoot these rats by themselves on a, on a dirt floor in a barn, and the horse is twisting his head back and forth and moving and stepping off the block. So we can't really critique our trims that closely from these. That's my only point going out. And you'll really see it on these DP views. So that DP is that uh, dorsal to palmer. Angle. So you're, the, the ray is coming from the front of the foot and going towards the back of the foot. This is what happens when we simply just bend the head for the horse. Look how much that changes. So how many of you have gotten x-rays back with a little arrow pointing to the impingement in the joint? I know I have. I've gotten a bunch of those. And then that, this would be an oblique view. So these are usually shot at a 65 degree angle 
and that's coming down right at the coronary band. That gives us a view of the navicular bone and the distal perimeter of the coffin bone, so we can see how those look. So these, those are the three, probably the three main shots that we see the most often. This is another one that gives you a better view of the navicular bone and the medullary cavity. And then when we get into the navicular, that medullary cavity is something that we look for. It should be healthy. It should be nice and black in the center. And then basically all your oblique views, it's real simple. If you're between your dorsal and your lateral and you're shooting your x-ray that way, that's your dorsal, lateral, palmar medial. So that gives you kind of a roadmap there if you see all those letters. That's, that's how to make sense of it. You could take a picture of that little diagram or find it online. But that way your mouth won't drop open and you won't start drooling if the vet starts saying those letters. So this is just one horse that I've had come in and I see a bunch of these. And, th and this is the case I wanted to make for not getting too serious about looking at these x-rays. I think they're handy for looking at sole depth, for maybe telling us how much dorsal hoof wall we have that can come back. Um, digital cushion, they tell us all kinds of things that can help us in our trim. But this particular horse, when we shot that DP, things looked good going up that limb. Medial lateral joint space was nice on that x-ray. The coffin bone looks level. It's got a little bit of side bone growing. But look at his knee and look at his fetlock. So there's nothing straight about that limb. When we sight the limb, it looks straight from the bottom. And the only reason I threw that in there is because I see guys do that all the time. And there's new terms invented all the time that I, I have a hard time keeping up with. The last one was, what, a harmonic groove? That was some barefoot trimmer I saw in mine. And I, we still don't know if you play the harmonic groove or if you <laughs> bone sounds or how that works. But one of the more recent ones is the argument about trimming to the long axis, the short axis, all this kind of stuff. You hang the limb right there, a lot of times it looks straight. You take it forward, grab them under the knee, and get it to hang in front of the horse, and you start to see angular limb deformities that you don't see there. So that's the other thing. X-rays sometimes lie, so does that. Because what that doesn't show us is that horse's knee. So that, that deviation is mainly in that horse's knee. Whoops. So now watch, this should be a video. <coughs> watch this horse hit the ground. So we got that horse trimmed flat. If we look at the long pasture and the short pasture and the harmonic groove, or whatever else you want to call it. This horse is lame because of that landing. And the reason we figured this out, this is kind of a, I've had to actually press the vets to do this. So you start blocking from the bottom up, right? You, you do a digital palmer block, you jump up to an abaxial. That's how they start kind of ruling out where the lameness is. Oftentimes when they do those blocks, they'll just block both sides. Because you got your neurovascular bundle running down both sides of the leg, kind of just back of the, of the fetlock. So the vets are in a habit to block the bottom of the foot and rule out any kind of heel pain or anything in the whole bottom of the foot. They block both sides. So what I've started doing when I get these horses in is I ask them to block the side that's hitting first. Just block the lateral side. Now that's, that's kind of a touchy diagnostic tool because it doesn't take long for that to diffuse to the other side. So timing is, is crucial. But we've gotten one horse to do this so far and, it, and it's looking like it's promising, I think, as far as using it diagnostically. <coughs> Any questions on that? So laminitis, Kenny talked a little bit about it. And I wonder sometimes now if we're seeing more. 
because we've made the shift from stock animals to pets. So most of the horses that we see come through Iowa State are about 400 pounds overweight. And so we, we deal with a lot of this. The only case I want to make real quick for, for laminitis, because I know you've all dealt with it. Look how that pony's standing. So it, it's simple. It's, it's, you, you can look at that pony and tell what he's trying to do. What's he trying to do? He just wants to get off his toe and load his heel. So it's simple. Why make it any more complicated than that? All we got to do is help him load the back half and help him unload the toe. We don't have to argue about it near as much as we think we do. And uh, Kenny talked real quick about horses found in all four feet. I've seen this happen twice now. If they're found in all four feet, standing like that doesn't help. They can't do it. So they lay down. And twice now I've seen that mistaken for colic where both the vets and the owners have forced these horses to get up and walk for an hour when he's actually foundered on all four feet. So that's something we talk about in the rotation. Don't, don't look past that. If they're laying down, check, a pulse, check for a pulse in the hind feet too. Get a whiff. I think that's what they did. So how you load the frog? I'm. I like heart bars, and you'll see through the rest of this talk, I use heart bars on just about everything. I think they're the best shoe ever. I like them because I figured out how to use them, and they work for me. If you want to use something else, and you get the same result, I won't argue with you. I don't care what you use. The wood block, all you know, I think screwing a piece of plywood on the bottom of a foot and casting it, can help those horses if you can't make a hard bar. All of this break over in every direction, do you think that pony cares about it? He doesn't care. He just wants to load his heels. So the argument's been made that we put all this break over on and they stand in the soft footing and they find a position that's comfortable. The position is still always right here. So I think as far as controlling dorsal um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The distortion of the dorsal hoof wall. When, when that's starting to come apart, maybe a roll, roll your, your shoe over the anvil or whatever, I think that does help keep that enough from stretching or pulling apart. But I'm not putting break over on a lot of laminatic horses because I think it makes them more sound. I'm, I'm kind of getting away from some of the break over stuff. And if you want to fight me about it, I'll be out in the arena. <laughs> hey, Doug? Yeah. Um, I used to get guys coming to the shop. And so I went there for the Chapman Clinic, tried that hard bar, but it doesn't work. And I used to tell them, I said, if the hard bar doesn't work, it's because you don't have it fitted right. Yeah. That cannot touch any part of the sole, cannot extend beyond the point of the frog, and you've got to really watch how you fit it in the heels. Right. You can't have any pressure other than on the frog. Yeah, I think. And too much pressure is as bad. You've right. got to find that. Yeah, if you don't know how to apply them, that might be a dangerous shoe to use. And what, what Ken's talking about, let me go back to that. So that staying, so if here's the point of your frog here, if you extend your frog plate too far up, you're putting pressure. Again, right against the bottom of that coffin bone, it's going to cripple the horse. So you got to stay back. And it, I mean, you don't have to be, it's not like you have to try to get it as close as you can to the front. I don't really believe, like it's been proposed, that the frog plate actually stops the coffin bone from rotating downwards. Because if they're fit properly, our frog plate's way back here. So it, it's not going to push it back up into place. It's just to get them a load on the heel. So you keep that about three quarters of an inch back behind the point of the frog. And then when I apply those, I want to be able to look down the back of that foot and just see a little hairline of light. But when the horse loads his foot, his heels come apart, his frog hits the plate, and then he's got some pressure on it. But like Ken was saying with pressure in the sole, I think the only part of that hoof wall that's meant to bear weight constantly or have pressure against it is the hoof wall. 
we start doing it constantly against the sole or the frog, meaning that the horse can't pick his foot up and relieve the pressure, then we start causing a problem. So fitting that heart, because I don't use them, but fitting that heart bar, if you go to the next slide, the frog plate itself looks like it is just simply an extension of the frog, right? It's it back is. from the apex quite a bit, so the angles and everything come off. Yeah. Okay. And part of the reason, you know, and these work, I know these work, and I know a lot of guys that use them. The reason I don't use these is because I don't have any control over ground pressure then at that point, right? So if I put a solid bar on, I, I can control what's coming up, and I can control what's going down by the amount of space I put in there. With this, it's always going to be against his frog, and every time he hits the ground, it's going to push up even harder into his frog. So some horses they might not work on. You might have to get something more solid in there. Uh, some horses it's working good if they've got a real atrophied frog. I'll drill a bunch of holes in that frog plate and use a dental impression material. The holes are so that it squishes down in and stays it underneath uh, the frog. But that is enough to load that frog and it moves enough that it's not going to irritate them. This, I can't believe that this keeps coming back up on the internet. But there's not that much that I'll argue adamantly about, but wedging up a laminated course is going to cripple it. It's all about protecting the circumflex artery, right? So you've seen those laminated feet with the deep grooves in them. When this comes down, it impinges the circumflex artery and you close off blood supply to the foot, to the dorsal hoof wall, not the foot. So then you've got that growth in the heel but nothing in the toe. Uh, wedging those up is pushing everything distally and dorsally. It's just going to cause a huge hematoma right in the, in the toe. And when this idea came out, I know a lot of us tried it and a lot of us had to go back and take them off because they weren't working. Reverse in a shoe doesn't do anything to load the frog. That's my only beef with that. <clears throat> at least put some dental impression material or something over there. But just flipping a shoe around isn't going to do anything to load the frog. It doesn't take any longer to do than just putting the shoe on the sideways. That's true. Put it on sideways. Yeah. Yeah. Or quarter crack. Good. Yeah, then you can fix that later. Yeah, it's job security. Um, the other thing I've I've seen happen, you know, putting horses in reverse shoes with laminitis long term, it's the same thing with me not being able to control ground forces with the pad. I can't control ground force against the circumflex artery. If I have a toe going all the way around, I can seat it out so I don't have any sole pressure, but then I've eliminated ground force coming up and hitting that horse where it's really sore. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Want to do what? To cover the toe. Oh yeah, I, I don't wanna... I don't understand that at all. Right. The other thing that I've seen happen, when you unload any section of the foot, like like with the quarter crack, we'll talk about that. That, that foot is very dynamic. We think we look at it like a block of wood all the time, but it's constantly changing. So if you leave a horse in those long term, you start seeing the coronary band drop right there at the toe. And it, it corresponds right with where that shoe ends, but it starts dropping down. So, and I've had those with really bad prolapse soles and everything else. Just roll your shoe around the top of the animal. You can get it to touch the hook wall seat it out real heavy. Some of those shoes I've had to roll clear back to the third nail hole to get them up there. That's a good good introduction to quarter cracks. So this is another thing that we fix a lot of at the university. And typically, I hate to say it, they're caused by the farrier. This one, you can see that horse is just short shot. The very first thing, and this is, this is where we got to educate these guys, farriers, barriers need to be looking at the coronary band, not just the bottom of the foot. The coronary band tells us a lot about how the horse is hitting the ground and whether or not it's healthy. So 
I guarantee you that that coronary band was shoved up for a long time before the crack blew. And, you know, so when I'm shoeing my own horses, I'm looking for that stuff and I'm going to try to fix it before that happens. So medial lateral imbalance, that horse that I showed you the video of, those are candidates for quarter cracks. This is how I fix them. I'm probably maybe one of the few guys at universities that doesn't glue shoes. Um, partly because I really bad at it. Uh, I have more glue on me than on the floor and everywhere else. I do glue my full extensions, but uh, typically I, I can get nails into just about anything. With the laminitis, I should have mentioned that. When those horses are acutely laminitic, don't drive nails in. Give them a week or two and just put some foam pads on their foot. If I do need to put a shoe on right away, I, I use the fiberglass cast. It's way easier for me to use than glue. And I can make a steel heart bar then, cast it on. They come back in two weeks, they look really good. I just cut the cast off, put four nails in, and they're ready to go back to work. So there's no transition. So to fix a quarter crack doesn't mean that we have to lace it and patch it. It means that we have to fix the cause of the quarter crack, which is coming from the coronary band. So there's no point in locking that thing into one position if we haven't gotten the coronary band to come back to, a, to its natural position. So I just put a heart bar on and I float the heel. And I'll tell the owners, you know, if that gets packed full of dirt or if it's settled back down, take a hacksaw blade and keep that cleaned out so it's not contacting the shoe. But some of those horses have come in with bad bleeding quarter cracks, like a good three to four out of lane, uh, three, three to four out of five in the lamest chart. And if I can keep that heel from touching the shoe, they'll trot sound. Um, sometimes I've got to build it up like with a rim pad or else forge out part of the shoe to keep it from touching. But you'd be surprised. You tack that heart bar on, float the heel, tack the heart bar on, get your other three feet done, and look back and you'll already see that cornering band coming down. It happens fast. So there's been times I've pulled it back <coughs> off and floated it more before I sent them out. I thought I had other pictures of it. Yeah, sheared heels, I think that's a worst case scenario in the quarter crack, but it's the same cause. It's a medial lateral imbalance, and it's a lot harder to fix because we can't just float one side. Those are, I've only dealt with one, and I didn't do very good at it. If somebody's got some pointers for me, I'd, I'd love to know how to fix sheared heels. I put a hard bar on, I, I, I just, did the best I could to keep the foot from moving, and it healed. But you didn't. I didn't feel like a rock star when I fixed the quarter crack and the horse tried it off. And I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I know I look tough, but I'm kind of sensitive and insecure. And so if I can't fix a horse right away, it really bothers me. I'll lay awake in bed at night. This here, I've seen a bunch of that too. Somebody put a big plate on there with screws, but they still didn't fix the cause of the crack. So the, the whole plate is pointless. We just trapped the foot in the position that's causing pain. The G-bar shoe, yeah, that's going to unload the heel as long as he's standing on concrete. So this goes back to my point with the heart bar. I, I don't have any control then over the ground coming up and hitting the side that hurts. It's the only reason I don't use the G-bars. And then this, um, I just have never had a reason, I've never had to wire a crack. I've always been able to float them. I'm not saying that they won't come when I've got to eat crow, but I haven't had to do it yet. Some of the problems that I've seen with this is we put the drain tube in, we cover it with our polymethacolate, and there's a tiny little hole that's supposed to drain bacteria out from behind your patch, and it gets full of urine and manure, and they start getting abscesses behind it. So. Toe cracks, I think, are mostly management, and it's recognizing the cause. I think 
that the more I've paid attention to that very pronounced krenna, does everybody know what a krenna is? That's it. So, yeah. Is there still a seat in the back? <laughs> Your coffin bones, every horse that's born doesn't have it. They develop a small notch right in the toe. And don't quote me on this, but I think it's like an 80 something, 75% of front feet and 65, it's a lower percentage of the hind feet. But I've gotten to really watch for that, both either if I'm trying to maintain the quarter cracks or if we have horses that are constantly abscessing out the toe there, draining out the front. Um, what happens, the, the larger these are, and I've dissected some and even seen them with radiographs that are huge, that lamina, it's working it best it can to try to fill in this whole section, but it was only intended to be an eighth of an inch thick. It works really well when it's that thick. When it's got to fill in an inch, those linear tubules become big and round and spread apart. And a lot of times when you come in and resect these cracks, you'll find little pebbles clear up there. You know, I found them better than halfway up the hoof wall. So it's just not, it doesn't have the integrity that the normal white line has to keep that debris and bacteria out. So a lot of those I've managed for years just by constantly resecting them. I've had horses that lived for like five, six years looking like a camel, you know, because it looked like they had two toes. But if I always resected that little inch at the bottom, I didn't have a crack that blew clear to the top. It's a lot easier to manage if you're shoeing these horses, but if they're barefoot, that's what I had to do. I think covering that lamina with the shoe helps that stuff from coming out, but you can't shoe every horse, they just won't pay for it. The other thing is recognizing where the crack comes from. So it's either coming from the bottom or the top. If they're coming from the top, that doesn't necessarily have to be in the dorsal hip wall. It can be anywhere on the foot, but it's a scar to the coronary band. And that's the same thing with those. I, I, I believe, just from my own experience, that they, every crack's got to be open knife it out and make a big wide opening so that you don't have a very like a real tight fissure in the foot that's constantly moving against itself and, and opening itself back up. So this one, I didn't do this, I just found that picture. I would have resected that even open a little more. Take it all the way back till you get good healthy looking lamina and then leave it there. This is like the definition of insanity, right? <laughs> Trying the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Uh, in the, this, I mean, to top it all off, that crack's coming from the top. It's not even coming from the bottom. <laughs> so, yeah, grasping horizontally across cracks doesn't work. It'll keep going past and you can put another mark. There's proof. This one, I'm not sure. I've seen people do it. Uh, I still can't understand how it's different from that. I've had it explained to me that like welders and machinists, you know, that they, they, if they see a crack going up someplace that they'll drill a hole in front of that crack and it's supposed to stop the crack. But it goes back to like a corner van being pushed up. If a crack is actually a result of pressure, unequal pressure, it doesn't matter what you put above it until you fix that unequal pressure, it's still going to go past whatever you put above it. How many of you seen white line disease? So I, I, like, I'm bombarded now, like in the position I'm in there, with manufacturers calling me all the time with their new pro products and they want me to try them out and demo them at the university. And the last one was, this another magic compound that kills white line disease. And they said you don't have to resect the foot, you just put it in and it kills the white line disease. I think even if we can actually come up with something that kills white line disease, if there's any part of the hoof capsule that's not attached, it has to come off. It's a detriment at that point. It's not protecting anything, it's not supporting anything, it's just basically <coughs> a big, big old hangnail. And that, that was there. She was probably, that was a mare that was 
I want to say like maybe two to three out of five lane. And it's because there was so much of that dorsal hook wall that was unattached that every time she walked, it was pushing right against her extensor process. As soon as we got all that off, she was sound. It took a year to grow it back. She's got a good foot on her now. But don't be shy about resecting those. If there's big sections of the foot, if you can stick a nail in there a half inch, take it off. Because it's just trapping dirt, bacteria, and it's, and it's moving the foot in the way it should move. Yes? When do you decide whether you have to shoe a foot when you resected it? Did everybody hear that? When do you have to shoe it? Um, I guess it depends, for me it depends on what the horse does. Does it have to go back to work? Where does it live? Uh, what are the owner's expectations? If this is a broodmare that stands in a soft pasture, I would not hesitate it just to send her home like that. Um, but that actually happened in the winter, and I was worried about ground being hard and all that sort of stuff. There's a not so bad case, but same thing. You can see somebody's been trying to treat that. They've been pouring purple stuff up there. And with, you know, in the horse industry, if it has a pretty color and it smells good, it's effective. <laughs> so I'm sure that smelled minty or some. I mean, that, if you want to sell something to horse owner, it's got to be a pretty color and smell good. That's my marketing advice for today. I wanted to just show you guys this real quick. How many of you have gotten x-rays showing those, what, what the vets call cysts in the navicular bone? For, until I started that job there, to me a cyst meant a bump. So I kept seeing those x-rays thinking he's got a bump on his navicular bone. And it wasn't until I dissected one I found a hole. And so I went and found one of the surgeons and I'm like, this thing's got a hole. He said, yeah, it's a cyst. I said, well, I thought a cyst was a bump. He said, no, it can be a hole. So, constantly learning something new. I have since then um, noticed that a lot of times we'll shoot laterals on these. After we see the cyst from that view, we'll shoot our lateral, and where the deep digital flexor is coming down around the navicular bone, just above it, it starts to mineralize. So, you know, going back to those x-rays, it's only bone cartilage or very dense structures that are going to show up as white. So if you start seeing that little section of white on the deep digital flexor tendon, that means it's starting to calcify or mineralize. And, and I'm noticing it more and more when they've got those cysts on their navicular bone. And then since then I've dissected a couple where that deep digital flexor tendon has actually adhered to that cyst. Like I, I couldn't cut it or pull it off of the cyst it was stuck to it firmly. So I don't know how to help those horses. Some of them have done a little better when I've raised the angle for them. But at, I mean, at that point, if the deep's just stuck to the navicular bone, I'm not sure even raising the angle how much that's helped or hindered, because it's not, it's not going to change any tension between your um, semi-lunar crest where it attaches in that navicular bone. That tension's going to be the same that looking at the medullary cavity, this is not a healthy <coughs> navicular bone here. This should be very black in the center. So when that medullary cavity starts to fill in and you see more and more white in there, it means it's laying down bone. <coughs> so, um, and then this one, this, is, this one's pretty nasty, so there's these big hooks on the side. And then this is what we traditionally call lollipops. It's what the veterinarians call synovial and vaginal. <coughs> so, I mean, if you if you hoof test a navicular horse, you usually get your most of your reaction about center of the frog. So for years I've been building hard bars, or not hard bars, but straight bars for the these navicular horses, and I didn't have enough wide, a wide enough bar to really even cover the area that most of them were reacting to. So more recently, I'm either putting a wider bar on, or I'm shooting them with heart bars, 
with no frog pressure. And I found that's worked really well because I've covered the whole area of the bottom of the foot that's, that's painful. So if you go straight up from the bottom of a foot, your navicular bone is almost dead center. So say here's your foot, like that. Your frog's going to terminate about right there. Your navicular bone's about right there. So you test those horses, and it's usually clear up here that you're getting a reaction on the frog. If you go from frog to heel, either way, that's where they hurt. So that's what we have to cover if we're going to shoot with a hard bar or a, any kind of bar shoot. Elevating the heels, it's like a catch-22, right? Because you watch those horses come in, and what are they all trying to do when they walk? They're trying to avoid their heel, right? Because their heel hurts, so they're stabbing their toe in the ground. So then we wedge them up to put some slack in the deep and give the navicular bone some relief, and we've made it harder for them to avoid their heel. So that's Jim Quick's shoe there, um, and I played with it, and I think it works. I know he moves this step down like clear up to the center, and I've been afraid to do it. But that'll allow a horse to come in fairly heel first, and it's moving the load further up the foot, and that the whole back end is kind of cantilevered. And then I've, I've been playing with this more. That chamfer, so that's a piece of, that's half inch by three quarter. I just forged the toe down, weld it, and then you can move that chamfer as far forward as you want on the heel, but you still have the same wedge effect, but you, you're making it so that you don't have that concussion right there in the back of your heel. So those are working really good. Since then, I figured out what to do with like the hundreds of wedged egg bar shoes that were in my shop. Uh, <laughs> I make that wedged egg bar into a straight bar and then drive the chamfer in. And and it does the same thing really quick, like if you're pressed for time. The problem is it's aluminum and you don't get any resets. But that's a quick way to do it if you have to. <coughs> same thing, that's the only point I'm making to cover up. This is where they hurt. I forgot I put that in there. I wouldn't have drawn the picture. Yeah. At the end of your shoeing air bowl with putting the hard bar on it, since running into frog pressure at that point? I think you are going to run into some frog pressure at that point, but I think they still appreciate the, the protection from the ground reaction. It's a, in a, the, you can make the argument like if you use an aqua pack or some sort of hook pack and deck that back after the foot, they've always got pressure on it then, but they've got some protection between the ground and the frog that's maybe dissipating shock or reducing <coughs> some. But, but yeah, you're, you you, that's probably unavoidable. Is that um, protection? Uh, well, obviously it's protection, but does it also um, isolate the movement of the tendon and the, the bones at all? Does that stabilize that from having to work the hard so part? much? Well, any of that caudal support. That's a good question, and that's one that I don't know how we answer. There's been an argument made going back to that whole breakover thing that by giving these horses break over, we're making certain kind of uh, strain less or work less. I don't know how we prove that. It's a tough one. I think there could be a good anecdotal argument for it, but to be uh, statistically significant, that would be a really tough one to try to. You'd have to put radio dense dots in the bike, and it'd have to be a measure of strain on tendons. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how much of that's affecting soft tissue. It's hard to say. This would be my preferred method for every navicular horse. <laughs> get them out of the gene pool, right? Because everyone that comes in, they finally get so lame that they can't ride them, and then what do they do? They make it a broodmare. And then three years later, we're working on their two-year-old babies. So how many of you old-timers, like, 40, 30, 40 years ago, what was the average age that you diagnosed a navicular horse at? Seven, eight. That's what we five, six, yeah. seven. That's what I. That's what I commonly saw was usually between six and twelve, maybe kind of in that bracket right there. Now we're diagnosing horses with severe 
bony changes in the navicular bone at the age of two. So I, it's not been proven yet that there's a genetic component, but, it, but it's kind of like one of those no duh things, right? Because it's in quarter horses. You hardly see it in most other breeds. And I think we've done a really good job of perpetuating it over the years. But it doesn't matter if he's got a pretty head. As long as his ears look nice. Yeah. <laughs> This is, this is actually a horse weed that I worked on, completely severed the deep digital flexor tendon. Um, that's what I use as the fishtail bar shoot. So at that point, there has been some surgical attempts to reattach those. They, they typically fail or don't do very well, or they still build up with so much scar tissue that the deep digital flexor tendon doesn't really even function. So what we're doing with that, have you guys ever seen one present with a, with a severed flexor tendon? So as soon as he puts a little weight on that foot, toe rolls right up off the ground. Um, so the purpose of this is just to keep the toe on the ground. There's scar tissue that's going to come in and form around the whole region. And that eventually becomes solid enough that it stabilizes the foot. You can take the fishtail off and the toe is going to stay on the ground. I've seen people that are using patent bars on these, and if it's completely severed, I don't understand the point of a patent bar. Because we want that scar tissue to come in and, and fill in with the foot in a position we want it in, so why do we let it start here and then keep tearing it as we go down? Just get it where you want it and it'll come back. It, is there a purpose for that reversed wedge fishtail? I couldn't. I, I thought there's probably a reason for that, and I couldn't figure it you out. Turn the toe too short. Oh, <laughs> turn the toe too short. <laughs> yeah. That's All called right. a suspensory shoe. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> so in this mare, this was a hind foot. Any kind of these these catastrophic catastrophic events, if they happen in the back, it's great because the, the back end is not having to support so much of the weight as the front. How long are you keeping those shoes on? That kind of, as long as they need it. Do you have another stupid question? <laughs> <laughs> that, that shoe was on, I want to say, we probably had that on about six months before that. And, and that's what I did was just evaluate the horse. When he came back in, we took the shoe off. We, made him take a few steps. If it was rolling up, we put it back on until it quit. So depends on, I mean, each individual case will probably be different. I've worked on two now, and I want to say that one was about eight months, the other was about six months before they stabilized. Is there another question in the back? Yeah, what would be your prognosis for a return to normal function after you've done all that? Hind foot would be really good. Front foot would not be so good. So. And then your faster gates are better, right? So at a walk, this horse walked fairly normal, and I wish I had a video of it. I've got some i got to put on here. You didn't notice much at the walk, except that there was a little bit of a hip hike because there's no longer any movement in the pastern on that foot. When you get her into a lope, you wouldn't even know that it had happened. So trot, trot and walk would be your two gates you saw most at. But she went back to, to work in light riding. I mean, not, she wasn't going to run barrels anymore, but she was a kid's horse, go down the road, lope circles, all that kind of stuff. Front foot would not be so good. Coffin bone fractures is another thing we deal with a lot. And most of the ones that we, we work on are these full fractures. I don't know why we see so many of those, but we do. And typically when they're that small, we don't do much except watch them. Sometimes when that bone breaks off and doesn't knit, then that horse's body starts to see it as a foreign object and start attacking it, and then you have abscesses in that area, and then they actually have to go in the bottom of the foot and take that piece of bone out. So my role in most of those surgeries is getting rid of the hoof walk, and then once I've got all that down to the sensitive structures, then the vets come in and take that stuff out. Doug? Yeah. Did you ever try a heel spring on that coffin bone fracture? A heel spring? Yeah, put a little, uh, you know, a little spring in there. And 
this page. We put that into the barge and yes. blow it. It'll squeeze that fraction of the Okay. About three or four weeks. So you want the spring actually bring in the heels out? The, the spread in the heels oh, bring it all together. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just make a little V shape. And you got to make sure you don't make the bars on it, the tips on it too long where it goes through the bars in the foot. Because then it'll get in a sense of the If you just try a little, give me a call and I'll send you a little wire. Yeah. Them. I'll I'll try it and if it doesn't work I'll give him your number and blame you. Retired. No, that would make sense. I mean, so most of these, it's basically just stabilizing the foot. Articular fractures are bad. They're tip, those horses don't typically come back good. Uh, maybe hind foot you'd have a little better prognosis, but anything that's articular or comminuted like that are not good. And and then most of those. I, we just recently worked on uh, actually this horse here, and, and I put a toe cap shoe all the way around that and filled it. The horse was actually a lot more comfortable once the shoe was on. That was one we worked on. Scott and I worked on that together. And just, I think, keeping that thing from moving within the side of the foot gave that horse a lot of relief. You could see it immediately. Um, if you're in a pinch, cast works. I don't think it works as good maybe as long because it starts to fatigue and flex so it probably wouldn't hold things as solid or depending on where the fracture is just pull a bunch of clips around the foot wherever you, wherever you need to stabilize the fracture. Questions on that? We gotta start cruising because I gotta be done.